everyone, and welcome to Medicine of Tomorrow. I'm Dr. Raphael Kelman, and all these podcasts are about foundational medicine, the real, real deep elements of health and healing, the foundational components that can help ignite the body's exquisite ability to heal. That's what we should be focusing on, of course. I'm very honored to have a wonderful guest today that I've just met, Dr. Michelle Shuffin. Michelle, thank you so much for being on the show, and I know you got a lot to tell us. There's no problem. We have like three hours to talk, so go ahead. Three hours? My goodness, my goodness. Let's hear a little bit about you. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Dr. Kelman. Thank you for having me as a guest. I'm really excited to ask you some tough questions today. You're asking me questions? I am. Well, Bi-directional. <laughs> um, a little bit about me. My name is Dr. Shuffet, Michelle. I started out practicing traditional medicine. I went to medical school, did my residency at UCLA, and if my father had had his wishes, I would have gone back to Kentucky and, and practiced in his office and you know, been a, a typical um, small town everything sort of doctor. And for me, it just wasn't, wasn't something that I truly wanted to do when all is said and done. I got much more interested in communicating and educating about health and medicine. And I decided after finishing residency to practice for a few years and then, and then leave. But I didn't leave health and I didn't leave wellness. I actually sort of, I'm going to say, meandered around the various topics. I've worked in the pharmaceutical industry. I've worked on the medical education teaching side. I've done a little bit of um, health publishing, working in the digital space and talking to consumers about health and wellness topics. And that's where I actually sort of discovered wellness, if you will. How, how long ago was that? Oh, goodness. Uh, that was 2017, 2018, when I started working in that area. And, you know, the company was called Everyday Health. It was one of the first times that I had been challenged with focusing on it from the perspective of keeping people healthy instead of figuring out what to do after they get sick. So I'm very curious, from your pathway, you trained in traditional medicine. Yes. How did you uh, start thinking outside the box? I was always outside the box. I don't remember ever being in the box. However, I could say this, to some degree, I sometimes have one foot back in the box, reorienting it. In other words, I still use some of the advantages that the pharmaceutical companies have developed, certainly the technologies, but with a whole new orientation and not following anyone's lead, the leader in navigating through the complex web of healing and disease and origins of disease and modalities and approaches to treatment, and then borrowing things that other people and other companies have come up with and figuring out how it integrates with the paradigm that I use. It was right from the get-go, a holistic understanding from the beginning. It's just the way I think that the world was built on something positive, good, kindness, whatever word you want to use. And that's fundamental because if you don't have that belief deep down, you can't expect anything good to come out of disease. So I always knew, and I studied philosophy then, and if you study philosophy, you're forced to look for paradigms, understanding. You can't sweep these types of things under the rug. You can't suspend them to say, oh, we'll deal with these questions some other time. You have to face them, either come up with an answer of nihilism or come up with something like I came up with. Anyway, obviously I came up with a very ecological perspective, but not an abstract ecological, and it's not deep ecology where human beings are just like animals or plants, part of a whole. It was that we are stewards of the world. So therefore, it was always an integrated, unified perspective, which means that nature and human beings and animals, we evolve together. I didn't believe in survival of the fittest. Nothing, I, I totally debunked, and I had a debate with him, Dawkins, who wrote The Selfish Gene, all of this stuff. I, I, I understood things as a unified way of evolving, and I was very much uh, oriented to the microbiome because I, you know, I never bought into the idea that bacteria are bad. So of course, these ideas came to me very quickly, and then that's how I got into holistic medicine. Now I call it foundational medicine because it includes the deeper elements of health and healing and including the states of being that the human being is composed of or, or contains. And it's very, very deep. That's well, what I do. Wow, well, my goodness. <laughs> so, so many things we could tackle there. Sure. Uh, you know, the, the fact that you're a doctor 
and a philosopher. That's a very powerful combination. And I love the, the description of bacteria aren't good, they aren't bad. There's no duality in this world that you're describing. And I think one of the things for me, you said you had one foot inside the box, one foot out. Right. I, I feel the same way because I really want to believe and embrace some of these concepts, but I struggle with the fact that there isn't a lot of evidence around some of these concepts. And I struggle with the fact that so many folks sort of create their own vernacular and their own words around these topics. So one of the things I was hoping you could do is clear up some of the confusion for our audience and for the folks who are who are listening. It's going to be a speed round of sorts. I'm going to give you a few terms, a few phrases, and if you could, in just a single sentence, sure. just a short phrase, explain Explain what each of these means for our audience. Sure. And I'm going to start with good old traditional one, Western medicine. I'll tell you about that, that idea. When people use the word Western medicine, they usually mean as opposed to Eastern medicine. Now that's already a problem because in the West now, there's a lot of studies going on, tremendous amount of studies of using herbal treatments, nutraceuticals, which are natural compounds found in various fruits, vegetables, herbs all over the world. And there's a tremendous amount of science, more of course than what came from the East. So is it only Eastern medicine that approaches the practice of medicine in a very different way? No. But of course, here in medicine, we're talking about things, right? And there are separate things that we could call diseases, that we could put them in boxes, and that's what disease is about. And health is the absence of those abnormal pathologies. And there's the other approach that's termed the ecological approach. Disease is not a thing, but diseases should be looked at from an ecological perspective, how different components of the body or of nature interact and compose a whole that's very different than, than the sum of its parts. That's now, the ecological. Now, when you say ecological, do you mean ecosystem? You might have to break yeah, that down a little bit. Yes. Um, the word ecological really does imply systems or component. Nature, it, the ecology means a whole. It means all the components of nature. So the very term implies a holistic conception. When we talk about the ecological understanding, it means that various physiological processes, organs, systems, cells. Now we know the microbiome, which are bacteria from out there that are now in here that are integrated in ways way beyond our current comprehension. And until we change our whole model of understanding, we're never going to understand what is, what's really going on. I could just say this, look at, at all of this in terms of AI, artificial intelligence, and beyond. Because artificial intelligence comes from what we put into a system. But we are part of nature. So any of the ideas or facts or that we're ever going to accumulate and put in to the computer that creates artificial intelligence comes from after nature started the whole process. It can't, doesn't precede it. So how is it gonna ever go beyond the intelligence in bacteria? It's impossible because we're composed of bacteria. Bacteria set the stage for the development of organic life. You know, you could look at in the inorganic world, the atom, although that's not true anymore, is the basic element of the inanimate world. In the organic world, the life of animals and plants and humans, it's the cell. And it happens to be the bacterial cell. That They started this whole process of life without bacteria on earth, there would be no life because they produce the carbon cycle, the nitrogen. Without carbon and nitrogen, we wouldn't be here. That is true. And also the other component, one of the incredible characteristics of bacteria is their ability to share DNA. They were originally started, so to speak, with four basic letters. The DNA is composed of different what's called nucleotides, which these are biochemicals that are made in a certain way. And there are four of them that are somewhat similar, but a little bit different. One's an A, you're, one's you're a D. You're taking me way back in school. I here. know, I know, me too. Four letters, and from those four letters, the whole story of life was written. It's just a question of how you shuffle and mix those elements. And, and that's what bacteria did. They shuffled them up. They transferred them from New York to Uganda. It's exquisite. It's an intelligence. That type of intelligence will never match. And here we go. It's in us. 
There you go. You touched a little bit on Eastern medicine. Mm-hmm. Just in its most simplest terms, what, what do people typically think Eastern medicine means? Think herbs. They exactly, think herbs. exactly. Well, That's a great... And they understood how this communication occurred. There are different systems. They didn't chop the human being up into organs, right? It was always a collective understanding or a holistic understanding, but also different organs or components or areas of the body, energetic centers, the flow of information centers had a particular psychological, emotional, higher elements of the human being that were integrated, that were part of this flow of information. That's exquisite. That's, you're talking about artificial intelligence or the real intelligence. Well, they, they were right on. We went off track and holistic functional medicine is not back on track in understanding this interconnectedness. That leads me to the, the rest of these words. So you mentioned holistic functional, there's integrative, there's alternative. I'm not a big fan of the word alternative because it makes it sound like a strange option of sorts. Foundational medicine, microbiome medicine. So maybe you could kind of take us through integrative, alternative, holistic, and functional and sort of explain what people typically are thinking or what practitioners are actually providing for patients and consumers in those areas and kind of lead us down the path of what it means to be involved in foundational right, medicine. Right, and then we'll right. get into micro, microbiome medicine right. after that. So this is why I came up with the word foundational medicine, because every approach that you just mentioned can be lumped together, integrated together, and it will equal foundational medicine because they're all right in and of themselves, they're missing something. Because each word that you used, each title, it's nuanced in a certain way. But the truth is you need all of those nuances to properly understand life and nature. You need as many of these descriptions as possible to try to get some understanding of how this is happening, right? We look at a tree, we, we can understand photosynthesis, every element of the tree, but we still don't understand what's a tree. What is this tree? Did it get us any further? No. No, it took us off track. And not only did it take us off track, but it it demystified things. It took out the component that ignites something very, very beautiful in us. Now the world is dead. We killed the outside world. Why? Because of the way we understood what's outside of us. And in fact, we thought everything is just me. So therefore, everything else is dead out there. Anyway, that's another conversation. My point is foundational medicine combines all of this because foundational medicine is what are the basic elements of the living entity, the living being that we're talking about? Let's talk about humans. What are the foundational elements that characterize the human being or the animal, the giraffe? Is there a list of those? Well, there is, but it it leaves it open to unending dimensions and elements, right? You could stop here, you could stop here, you could ascend as high as you want, or you could stay down here in understanding organic life, a plant, fish, a human being, as this, dead stuff. Foundational medicine leaves open the possibility for all of these elements of life. And you also need to know this hierarchy because you have to address the foundational elements that constitute health and healing. And you want to activate and work on those systems first to get this living entity to express life and health. So I have to believe then that the microbiome would be one of those elements that you have to address first. And I think you'll appreciate this. The first introduction I had to the microbiome actually came, you know, during my training as a pediatrician. We often worked hand in hand with with OB-GYNs. And when a baby is born, there was this whole controversy might be a strong word, but this whole construct of vaginal deliveries were better because it deposits a natural Mm -hmm. microbiome Mm -hmm. on the baby's skin Mm -hmm. at birth versus a cesarean where baby doesn't have that that experience. So that's probably the first time I ever learned about a microbiome. I, I don't know that I have that much exposure to it from the perspective of driving health and wellness in the way that you do in your practice. Yeah, and that's what the research is showing. There isn't a known physiological process that constitutes human health that the microbiome is not intricately and inextricably interconnected to and causally connected to. That's profound. I don't know of a disease that the microbiome is not playing a 
big role, either one in attempting to heal it, or because the microbiome is not healthy, is unable to protect the body. What makes a, bi- a microbiome healthy versus unhealthy? Okay, so that's a, that's a good question. And I think, uh, let, me, let me give a visual description. So if you think of the Amazon or any ecosystem, let's go to Seattle, and we're in this incredible rainforest. When I went through it, you know what I saw? I saw roots of high plants. You know where the roots were rooted in? The air. In the air. It was so lush that nutrients and water was in the air. The roots were extracting nutrients. That's incredibly full of life, elements of life. But also think of it, the green. If it's green, all kinds of shades of green, infinite number of shades of green. And you don't see much brown and healthy rainforest. Think of the microbiome in the same way. Is it lush? Does it have many shades of green? Is it full? That's a metaphoric description of a healthy microbiome. So if you want to look at it from a more scientific description, it's the diversity of the bacteria, the sheer numbers as well. But diversity is most important. Why is that? Because each bacteria has a unique profile, power to it, whatever it is. Just like every human being has something so unique about them. Same thing with the bacteria. They're all unique and they all have a specific ability, right? When you combine them, they each use their incredible characteristics or attributes, for lack of a better word, to help the whole system, the whole community, the whole ecosystem, so that it functions better. When it functions better, it means for themselves. In a community, you, you, you're healthier, right? They help each other. And we know this, like when we were just trying to destroy them with antibiotics, what do they do? If one group of bacteria figured out a way to overcome the antibiotics, change their genetics, you know what they do? They transfer that information to their friends. I was going to say they send it to their friends. <laughs> yeah, it, it could be in another country. I and mean, we're talking about like, magic. You know, we're talking about stuff that's way beyond this way we understand how the world works. You should write like a book about it for kids, you know. The bacteria have this ability to work together, but each one has their own unique power. And when they, they work together, it's better for them and even better for us. So if the bacteria work together, they're powerful. In theory, most of us are born or ultimately have this beautiful lush microbiome. What is it that we are doing as as humans or as a society that impacts that microbiome in such a way that someone needs help? I'm going to use the word replenishing it yeah. or bringing it back to that, that beautiful yeah. state. The lack of unity. The lack of human unity that we're seeing all over the world, in my opinion, that's the greatest problem that we are facing in our physical health. I mean, I'm not kidding. I used to think it Does was- Does that translate as stress on the body or? Terrible stress. But a type of stress that we've never understood as a stress. You know, when you look at the health of nations, right? Which you need to understand in order to understand the health of the human being. The health of nations is about unity. It's about education. Did it provide basic needs of human beings? Did they have mutual responsibility? Mutual responsibility means there's no poverty. No one could be living in the street. Every child has to have the same opportunity to flourish. Otherwise, the nation's gonna be sick. And not only that, in today, when we live in a global right, society, if we're sick here, then they're going to be sick in Japan or in China or whatever, or you, anywhere, right? It's all interconnected. It's, it's just the way it's evolved. In our nation today, the division and the hatred, to me, the most worrisome medical problem. It is. And I'm not sure this is the, the exact right term, but it, yeah. it's the term that came to mind to me. And it, it's sort of a disruption of the collective unconscious mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and sort of a breaking apart. And exactly. if that's leading to a lot of disease and a lot of issues associated with the microbiome, sure. That's where the opportunity comes in to try to support it and, and build it back piece by piece. Yeah. Because the, the bigger problems you're describing are certainly not something that we as individuals can tackle in the world of medicine as a one by one thing. We can't we can't really well, tackle it in a much bigger bigger yeah, way. But but yeah. helping each person restore that balance and restore right, that right. sensibility well, I think seems to, like to a question is yes and no. Okay. All of existence is in us. So therefore if you improve your own unity within your own consciousness, the way you see other people, you are impacting your health. And not only that, your 
helping other people's health too when you interact with them. So the answer is both. I love this concept of bringing us all back into a state of unity and, and sometimes people need support in doing that. And I know one of the things that you've brought forward as, as a solution to help support this process is the microbiome diet. And it has a couple of different stages and I was hoping you could share a, a little bit about how that works and how it can help recreate this sense of, of unity, not only with, within the individual, but in, in the greater collective that you were speaking about. The only reason why the book says the microbiome diet because the publishing company wouldn't publish it unless it wasn't diet. Is diet a dirty word? Yeah, it's an unnecessary word, but I look at it as you know microbiome rejuvenation or restoration because, first of all, it's not about the foods that you need to cut out because that will happen indirectly. It's more about the foods that you want to add in. It's like you want to feed the bacteria that they need and then things will unfold in a positive way. You're not going to want the unhealthy foods as much, etc. But it's not just about diet. The microbiome rejuvenation, there are many elements to it. Like we were saying, there's a psychological, emotional component. Your feeling of stress, when I'm using the word stress, it's much more than the common notion of stress. It goes back, like we were saying, the subconscious elements that are acting on us without us knowing. We don't know what's operating us. Scientist Freud thought of the elements in us that are driving our behavior, the id, the ego, super components in us that we're unaware of that's driving our behavior. Right? Self-preservation. Absolutely. You could call it subconscious, but I think the subconscious doesn't have to be subconscious. It could be brought to regular consciousness, but there are many, many layers of the subconscious. And then there's a collective grouping of or interconnection of the subconscious, right? So if I wanted to explain this, and I, and I like the word rejuvenation, I like that word a lot. If I wanted to educate someone on that, talk to folks about rejuvenating the microbiome, so what's the exact process? I go right to some very concrete things, which foods to add. When you approaching this microbiome rejuvenation approach, think of it like this. You're going out to dinner or you're eating at home with your best friends. So aren't you interested in what they want to eat? They care about you. You don't realize it because you don't see it. You're not connected to them. But their interest that goes back years, millions of years, is the interest of the development of life. And now they're in you. So their interest is in, in the development and the preservation of your life. So it's about true nourishment. Yeah. If they're interested in your health, then when we're eating, I think it's a good idea if we're interested in what they want to eat. The science is showing it has a profound effect on our health. How do I know what they want to eat? Education, a big component of this approach to medicine is education. And with education, there's tremendous empowerment. You know, you'll be way ahead of any doctor if you know this body of knowledge. And it's out there to be learned. It's knowing about which prebiotics, right? Because those are basically the fibers that are found in these very foods that are so good for the microbiome. To know about the right types of probiotics, and it's different for each type, of, for every person, for the types of health challenges that you have. By doing that, they're gonna produce compounds from these foods that we give them, or the prebiotics, which are the fibers that are found in these foods. We're gonna nourish them. They're gonna produce compounds that have a most profound healing effect on us. They can actually speak to the genes and turn genes on and off. If you have inflammation, autoimmune disorder, long haul COVID, improve your microbiome because they're going to then talk to the genes. We're gonna have to turn these genes off right now. Because you could turn certain genes on and certain ones off. That's the whole field of epigenetics. And I believe that prebiotics are even more important than probiotics. Why is that? I feel we need to step aside, let nature take its course with our assistance in providing it the right soil, water, sunlight, and let this natural intelligence do the rest for us. Michelle, <laughs> you, know, you know, thank you so much. You know, you asked me all the questions. I think we should, I start, did. We should start again and flip it around and let me ask you questions and tell us, you know, the next podcast more about you and what you do and how you're improving the health of our country. I'd be happy to do that. It was a pleasure. Thank you all for listening to Medicine of Tomorrow. And I'm Dr. Raphael Kelman, and we'll see you on the next podcast.